attention for our um for your upcoming uh two weeks training camp that will be held on july uh it, it will include some cooperation with major companies like Halliburton and Schlumberger. Uh, so, and also uh, you should stay tuned and stay on for this uh, great opportunity. Uh, today's lecturer is a man of experience. Uh, he is almost a legend of oil and gas industry. I, I would like to uh, address the biography. Uh, Mr. Zachary Evans is the reservoir storage manager for WSB, a leader in uh, underground energy storage consulting. Mr. Evans has over 15 years of gas storage experience, having spent the majority of his career as a student, as a senior uh, storage engineer with TC Energy family for companies, operating assets for the largest storage and pipeline company in North America. That's great. Uh, his current role involves oversight of all uh, WSP's reservoir uh, storage work, including engineering, compliance, and project management, in both traditional gas storage and the hydrogen uh, economy. Prior to his work in the storage, uh, Mr. Evans spent several years as a measurement while trained uh, engineer for Schlumberger, with international placements in Saudi Arabia, Malaysia, and Australia. He is a lifelong member of the Society of Petroleum Engineers, where his volunteerism focuses on student outreach and support for young members. He is uh, currently uh, serving as SPE uh, International Board as uh, the Regional Director of North America. So basically, the man is a living legend. And <laughs> so, uh, all right, uh, Mr. Evans, thank you for reaching out today and uh, accepting our invitation. We're very glad to have you here. And before we get started, I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to Dr. Ahmed al garhi and Dr. Kamal bin Nasser for the, for the help that they have provided for us. And on behalf of my fellow students, I'd like to express how glad we are to have you here today, uh, Mr. Evans. And the mic is over to you. You can share the right. screen. Okay. Well, I certainly appreciate those very kind words. I, I, I don't know if I'm a legend of the oil and gas industry, maybe a legend in my own head, but, um, but anyway, I, uh, I'm happy to, to um, speak with you guys today. I, I love speaking with students. I, I've, and one of the excellent things about being involved in SPE is I've been able to speak with students all around the world, and not just in the Middle East, but in Southeast Asia and South America, and of course, here in the U.S. Um, so I love, um, talking with students because I know how much I would have benefited from, from you know, information like this when I was a student and learning about all the different roles in the industry, especially in parts of the industry that aren't so common, like underground storage. It's a very necessary part of our energy infrastructure around the globe. Um, and we'll learn a lot more about it and about how, how crucial it is. And then maybe it's something that you might want to consider in your own career. Um, and, uh, you know, using my, uh, Using the last little bit of my um, Arabic that I remember, I'll say the the presentation will go well. Alhamdulillah and uh, shukran for the invitation. Right, so um, haven't have never been to Iraq, but maybe maybe one of these days. So the goal here today is very simple. I'm going to give you a very basic overview of what underground uh, hydrogen, uh, not hydro hydrogen, but hydrocarbon storage is basically what it is from a physical standpoint, how petroleum engineering gets involved in that. We'll talk a little bit about how storage goes into energy transition, but mostly it's just gonna be an overview of this because you can get pretty detailed in any of these topics, but I just wanna cover as much as possible. And just to confirm the timeline, is this supposed to be an hour along with Q and A? Did can someone tell me, just, just confirm that it, that the presentation is supposed to be an hour long? Yeah, it, it could be more than an hour, maybe okay, uh, yeah. an hour and a half. Well, that's that's oh, okay for us. No, no worries. I talk a long time. You won't have to worry about me running out of words. But. <laughs> All right, so here, here's the agenda we're going to cover. First, we're going to talk about underground storage types and use because there are very different kinds of underground storage, geologically speaking, and there are very different kinds of 
uh, business models and companies and people who would operate storage for different reasons. Then we're going to talk about the basics of uh, more of like the, the physics and the, and the engineering aspects of salt caverns and depleted reservoirs. Those are the two main types of storage uh, in terms of the structural traps. Then we're going to do a brief case study on U.S. natural gas storage, not because it's pertinent to everywhere across the world. Obviously, it's not going to be pertinent to you in Iraq, but it does show a good example of why these businesses exist, because you need reliability, because there's commercial profitability. And so it's a good example of why something like this matters. Fourth, we'll talk about how storage is involved with the energy transition. It's very much involved with the energy transition, not just in storage of natural gas, which as we see in recent events is a very important thing to have reliable sources of natural gas, but also in terms of carbon sequestration and potential hydrogen storage. And then we'll take questions. Um, I'm happy to stay on as long as possible, answer as many questions as possible. And then you'll have all my personal contact information at the end of this. Um, and you can contact me literally at any point. I, I love speaking with students. So just a little bit of background. You, you already read my, my resignation and there's my little formal uh, headshot with my little bow tie. But the main thing for, for you, for you uh, folks here is I am a petroleum engineer by, by degree. I did study petroleum engineering and I actually did start my career um, in the Middle East. I lived in Al-Khobar, Saudi Arabia for a couple of years and worked offshore mostly. I worked offshore in Kachi and as well as in Saudi, mostly in, um, in drilling exploratory uh, oil wells. Um, but it's a great, it was a great opportunity to see the world. But I came back and then I started working for a pipeline company, which was called Columbia Gas, which is now called TC Energy after a buyout. And they are the largest pipeline company and the largest storage operator in North America. So I have a lot of experience when it comes to the operations side. And then for the last three years, I've been working for WSP, who essentially is the leader in um, consulting. The big thing for WSP is if you've ever heard the Strategic Petroleum Reserve mentioned in the U.S., where we stole all our strategic crude oil, um, our company developed that for the federal government back in the 70s, and we still help work and design on that. So, um, you know, we, we, that's where our expertise comes. And then obviously I've been involved in SBE. I currently serve on the board at least for four more months. My three years is coming to a close, um, but I encourage everyone to, uh, to be involved in SBE. Remember, your, your SBE dues are free while you're a student, and then your first year is free after you graduate. It's a great resource just for things like this, where you get in touch with people in industry and find out about the jobs that they do and the opportunities that they have. Um, so it's always important to, to plug SPE a little bit. So let's talk a little bit about gas storage or just underground storage in general. So it's, underground storage is pretty simple. You're just, you're just storing a commodity back underground in the same kind of geological containment areas where it was originally sourced. Sometimes this is a depleted reservoir that used to contain um, natural gas or oil. Sometimes it's an aquifer that never contained hydrocarbons, which it still has a lot of pore space. Sometimes it's a salt cavern. Sometimes it's a hard rock cavern that you physically mine like you would in a mining operation. But it's always for one specific purpose. You store underground when you have too much of a commodity and not enough of demand. And then you withdraw when you have more demand than you can meet with local supply. It's just an economics problem. When you have too much, you store, and when you need more than you than you have on hand, you withdraw. Um, just and we just use the same way you would use your bank account to store money and then to take money out. We use underground geologic uh, facilities to do the exact same thing. Now the uses of underground storage are varied. The biggest one in the U.S. is for natural gas storage. The biggest in the U.K. in the EU and U.K. is also for natural gas storage. But that doesn't mean that's the the only thing, and it doesn't mean it's the biggest thing is in terms of growth. Because going forward, there'll be a lot more uses. So for hydrocarbon storage, we store natural gas, we store crude oil, we used to find other refined fluids like kerosenes and NGLs and other things of that nature, as well as LNG. You can store all of these in different in underground storage facilities. You can also store other gases. You can store hydrogen, although we'll talk about that a little bit. That's almost entirely in salt caverns and very rare around the world right now, even though it's growing. And I don't, and this is a fun fact to learn, but there are, there are some strategic helium reserves. The U.S. actually has a strategic helium reserve the same way we have a strategic oil reserve 
it's a post-World War II kind of remnant, but since helium is heavily involved in space exploration, it actually becomes very important. Compressed air storage is another way of storing uh, uh, energy underground, but instead of storing natural gas or another commodity, direct fuel commodity, you basically store uh, thermal, um, uh, uh, you know, just air. You just heat up air and store it. And then you, when you release it, it'll spin a turbine. There's only one power plant in the US that does this. It's a very complicated and, and often not economically viable situation, but you can do that. But then when we can also think of storage, we also have to think of it as disposal, right? So there's also using the pore space for long-term disposal of not just things like oil field waste, like brines and produced waters and stuff like that, but also industrial waste, including carbon, right? So, um, you know, carbon sequestration, um, is a good name that people talk about, but really it's carbon disposal, right? Storage implies you want to get it back out, but if you're just getting rid of it, that's more of a disposal operation. So we've talked about why people would operate this, but who owns these facilities? Well, the biggest facilities around the world are owned by pipeline companies, independent, independent storage companies, and the energy utilities themselves. These are the people who are incentivized to have a reliable source of either natural gas or crude oil or some other kind of liquid so that there is ample supply for when their customers need it. It's not, not usually the direct people selling the service that own it, although that is possible. Usually it's an intermediary, what we call a midstream company that helps to transport and, and supply that. Oil and gas producers can own uh, stores themselves if it, if it is uh, up to advantage based on their business model and, and things like that. We already talked about the midstream entities, and those are also include the people who process the gas, the people who turn natural gas into NGLs and things like that. Refineries often have service because they'll use a lot of these commodities as feedstock for their for their processing. So if they run out of that, they have to shut the factory down. So it's important to not just have a pipeline supply, but also a storage supply in case there's an interruption. Other industrial processors that make different things like cement and steel, they also might need this kind of source. And then of course, national governments. We already talked about the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Many countries around the world have similar strategic reserves that are, are the goal is to have anywhere between 30 and 90 days of energy coverage. <laughs> in case there is some kind of problem with their local supply. So that's who operates and who owns the, the storage facilities. So let's talk a little bit now about the actual facilities just themselves. And it's basically four types of underground storage and we'll talk about them in detail. The first is the salt cavern. The salt cavern is the number one rated, it's the absolute best you know, that you can use when it comes to underground storage because it is a true void space. You know, a lot of times when you talk to people about, uh, about oil and gas, they think you're drilling a well with a jackhammer down to an underground lake or an underground cave, and then you're just sucking the, the oil or gas up through a hose. You know, that's just kind of the common person's understanding because they don't understand porosity and geology. But when it comes to a salt cavern, that's pretty much what it is. It's a complete void space within a large salt deposit that we use to store whatever we want. And the reason it's so advantageous is because we don't have to flow through the rock matrix, right? So our flow potential, our flow rates are much, much higher. Our, our ability to store is much higher because we have 100% capacity. And also because the salt itself is very integral. It's very, um, it's very hard to lose any of your product because of migration or integrity concerns within the reservoir. The problem with the salt cavern is, is that it's very limited by, by geography. We'll show that it doesn't, salt deposits don't exist everywhere in the world. Depleted reservoirs are more common, especially here in the US. For TCF, that's how much working gas we store every year uh, in depleted reservoirs here in the US. Um, because they're just larger, right? Your oil and gas reservoir, I mean, you, you talk about, especially over in, in the Middle East, I mean, these are some of the largest reservoirs in the world. So you have those, you have that capacity, right? And when we're talking about these things at scale, when you're trying to store enough commodity to keep, you know, cities and countries in power for days and weeks, you have to have very large scales. So whether or not it used to produce oil or gas, as long as you have it depleted, you can reuse that same space that originally housed the gas 
as a great source for um, storage in the after effect. You basically just convert it. Aquifers are the exact same thing, except aquifers did not contain uh, hydrocarbons naturally. They just contain water. And so there's some complications and some advantages, but you can store natural gas in an aquifer. Um, I should mention that you can't store every commodity in each type of these. You can store anything in a, in a cavern, um, but you can usually only store gaseous commodities in a reservoir because of different complications. And then finally is a hard rock cavern. It's also called a mined cavern. And it's literally just a mined room, room and pillar type mining that um, is man-made uh, underneath the subsurface that creates a cavern. And then sometimes you line that cavern with steel and concrete, and then you just use it as an underground storage tank. It's usually less, um, less frequent and it, and it has its disadvantages, mainly its cost, but sometimes you don't have the geology that allows you to use something else. So a lot of times, in fact, where I live, there's a chemical refinery about 45 minutes away. And actually WSP, before I joined them, built them a hard rock cavern because they didn't have the, the geology that they needed to be able to store the liquids that were part of their refining process because they couldn't use the reservoirs that are nearby. So we're going to talk about salt caverns. Here's an example of what a salt cavern looks for. This is in the U.S. Gulf Coast. This is in Louisiana. Um, just because in this case they're 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 not always underwater, but this is close to the coast. Um, but it's all usually one big salt dome. But you can develop individual caverns. You think you can have one big house, but you have many rooms. It's the same thing with a salt cavern. So this is what we talk about when we talk about salt cavern uses. And there's a little example of what we're talking about in terms of this simple drawing. But we can store anything we want to in a salt cavern. It doesn't have to be simply gas. It can be any kind of liquid. It can be anything like that. Because again, the salt itself is very integral and you're not going to lose your commodity in the same way you have to worry about with the reservoir. Oh, oh compressed air storage we talked about. Hydrogen storage is a big part of this. Um, we'll get into this in more detail, but the only proof of concept of hydrogen storage at scale uh, in the world is in salt caverns. And, and WSP is involved in a lot of those and they're, um, they're growing. There's, just, there's a new project that just started and there's some rumors of an, of an even newer project that's down the road. And then you can also use salt caverns for, for waste disposal, although that's not a particularly good use because um, it, you know, it, it would be like taking a mansion and then filling it up with garbage. Technically you could do that, but there's better things you could do with, with that property than, than just dispose of things. So let's talk a little bit about the geology. Why is salt so advantageous? Well, if you look on the left, it shows a, a breakdown of porosity and permeability in different circumstances. And if you look at the range for intact salt, which is in the colored portion, you see how low the porosity is and how low the permeability is and where the line for granite is, which in granite we think of as essentially impermeable from a, from a traditional drilling and geology standpoint. And you see that salt is both less, less porous and less permeable. It essentially is a, is a perfect seal. It will not allow um, you know, um, transmission. Now you will, um, you know, water will dissolve it, but you know, if you keep it at water-free environment. The other issue is on the right, which is the ability of salt to heal, which is that the crystalline structure of, of, of salt, either if it's been crushed or it's been dilated and there is imperfections, it will heal itself. It will form that, that more integral bond like you see over on the right, the very far picture. Any metal, any element will do this, okay? This is just a physical um, trait. The problem is, is that most of these do these will heal at incredibly high pressures and temperatures. Salt will heal at very reasonable pressures and temperatures that we see as we operate storage um, underground. So when you're talking about, you know, a few thousand, you have to forgive me, I'm using English units here. I'm not sure if you guys are in metric school or not, but if you're thinking three or 4,000 pounds and a few, you know, 300 or so, um, degrees uh, Fahrenheit, then you'll get that healing. You don't have, and some of these elements you would have to get to, you know, tens of thousands of, of PSI to theoretically be able to heal. 
So that's why salt is so advantageous. I do see there's some questions in the chat. I'll get to all of those at the end, if you don't mind. I will answer every question you guys have. You got me all, all evening. Um, when we talk about salt, this is what it looks like. There's a lot of different ways that salt accumulates underground, but the main thing you need to recognize about salt is it's a magmatic injection. Basically, it's a molten um, uh, rock you know, and it, it, it's rock in its molten state that will inject itself up into the stratigraphic column, right? So the most common salt domes we see are in this top right here around the U.S. Gulf Coast or over here in Germany, or, or and, and ironically, these are where the most salt caverns are. And so it will push, it will displace the rest of the rock and it will push up and create this dome. And then what happens is you will drill a well on the top of that dome and create your cavern. And then it's the cavern is entirely encased within that salt. So that's what's most common. Down at the bottom, you'll also see what we call bedded salt. And although there aren't always salt deposits, domal salt deposits everywhere in the world, in a lot of other places, there's also bedded salts, which is a more of a traditional sedimentary layering, like we see our normal kind of sandstone, shales, limestones, and things like that. But because there are those stringers, because there are those layers of non-salt, we do run into issues of integrity. It is a little bit um, more difficult to operate. It's dirtier. That's the word we use for that kind of salt. Um, so it poses its complications, but it still can be used for certain applications as a salt storage facility. Now, when we talk about construction, everything you need to know about construction in storage versus construction in traditional E and P wells is that everything is pretty much the same. It's just sometimes a lot simpler. Um, and in the case of salt caverns, it's a lot bigger, right? So a cavern well, the whole operation is very simple. We actually just started drilling a well for one of our customers and they'll take about 70 days to do so, um, which is a long process, but again, it's high pressure, high you know, risk, high integrity kind of operation. So you need to be very, very careful with things. Um, so you drill into the salt deposit wherever you need, wherever you want to build your cavern. And if there's another cavern on that salt deposit, there are regulations and best practices in terms of spacing to make sure that you don't affect the stresses of the other cavern. You know, you don't want to put them right on top of each other. Same like, you know, drainage in a traditional oil field. And then you begin solution mining. So you'll build a plant that will essentially pump fresh water down that well. And it, it's called leaching or solution mining. Either one is the same, but it will dissolve the salt and then you'll pump the brine back out and it will leave this, that void space, that pure cavern that we can store a commodity in. Depending upon how big a cavern you are building, which is usually based on how much you can sell in terms of the service, because you don't want it to be too big and you don't want it to be too small. You want it to be exactly the right size so, you, so you're not paying extra for, for equipment or services that you don't need. But it could take anywhere from months to years to, to, to solution mine the cavern. And then after you get done solution mining, one of the big problems is what do you do with the brine? Now, some places like around the U.S. Gulf Coast, brine is used as an industrial agent. So they'll sell that to another company who will then use the brine as part of their chemical refining process or industrial process or, or some other kind of uh, manufacturing process. In other more isolated areas, even if you have good salt, for example, I live in West Virginia, which is along the Ohio River near Pittsburgh, and there's actually a big, that's where the shale boom in the U.S. took off, the Marcellus and Utica shale, and there's actually a lot of folks who have been looking for years at developing salt cavern storage there. We have a lot of traditional storage, but not salt cavern. We have salt. But the problem is, is we don't have any good place to put the brine. And you can't just dump the brine in the river. You can't just dump it on the ground. And we're talking, you know, a lot of brine here. This is, a, you know, tons of barrels. We're not talking small volumes. So you need to be able to find an outlet for the brine as well. Here's another example of salt cavern construction where you'll drill down, you'll have your hanging string. And when I say things are big, sometimes the hanging string in the in a salt cavern, you know, the, the leaching string is 16 inches and the production string when you float the backside is anywhere from 20 to 24 inches. So you think about how big these wells are. Some of these wells by themselves will move 1 billion cubic feet of gas in a day. It, that's the size that we're talking about. Um, so you see what the a domal salt on the left 
And then on the right, you see the bedded salt and you see on the bedded salt, you're gonna have more fill, you're gonna have more uh, slump and cave in and you might have potentially more problems with integrity. Um, you know, so it's not perfect, but um, you know, it is an option under the right circumstances. Here's a 3D image from a, a sonar log that kind of shows you what a salt cavern looks like in reality. It's not really uniform, but it is much longer and taller than it is wide just because of gravity. Remember, because we're doing solution mining, so it's just a drainage type operation. You can see that this can be anywhere from 1 billion to 30 billion barrels inside. They can be several thousand feet uh, deep. They can be you know, a mile deep before, they could be several thousand feet tall and still a mile below the surface, roller shallow. They can be several hundred feet wide. So that gives you a frame of reference for how big we're talking about here. The largest salt cavern that operates in the US, I believe it sounds about 56, Philip 66. If you look up the Empire State Building in New York City, the entire building will fit in the salt cavern. That's how big these things can be. Here's the, where the salt is in the US. There's some up in uh, well, Eastern uh, um, Canada, but it's not really developed. The big developments in the US are along what we call the Finger Lakes in New York, uh, right? I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it's just south of Toronto in the US side near Buffalo, New York. Also along in Michigan near Detroit. But then the big plays is down here in the US Gulf. And you can see all the little red and yellow cavern symbols. Well, that's where all the developed caverns are. And there's also some out in the Midwest and as we go up into Canada. But the big play right now is over here near Salt Lake City um, because they have a very unusual um, kind of domal salt like you would see in, in the US Gulf Coast out there. And that's where they're doing some development. And that's very important because that's very close to California, which is pushing a lot of the hydrogen storage. Globally, you see that most of the, of the salt, uh, there's a lot of places that don't have salt. And most of it is in Europe. Um, we do see some big um, deposits in, in Russia. There's rumored to be some big deposits in China, but obviously they're not always particularly um, um, open with their conversations. And then in the Middle East, you'll see along uh, you'll see some along the Gulf Coast regions. Um, I know Adnoc is looking very carefully at some development and even, even Aramco is looking um, at some potential development but it's very early stages. So at least in your, uh, in, in your area, um, there is some potential salt, especially up here in the, in the Northern part. Uh, so, so you do have some, some opportunities there. And just some other global considerations, most of the development in, in, is in Europe and it's in Germany and Netherlands. A lot of that is driven not just by the geology, but by the politics, you know, the ESG type strategies that they've been doing for, for decades now. Um, in recent years, there's been a lot of development in Russia and China, but as I said, there's not a really a lot of information on exactly how much or how big, and I don't think we'll ever get that information because they are very uh, tight-lipped about that. Uh, but in the Middle East specifically, like I said, Aramco and Adnoc are both looking into this heavily as they look to diversify away from just strictly um, a crude oil. Let's talk a little bit about hard rock caverns. I'm not a hard rock expert. I'm a petroleum engineer, not a mining engineer. But mainly, we'll just talk about the details. Caverns are either developed fresh, they're, dr they're drilled in room and pillar mines just from scratch, or they are um, converted from abandoned mines, a variety of different geologies, and they're often lined with steel and concrete. If you see this back here, we have the mesh here, and then they've gone in with concrete, and they've essentially lined it there, because you can't, you know, you can't case a cavern in this sense, and you don't have that salt, so there's some options there. Um, the shafts are, are drilled to depth, and then they'll do conventional mining techniques to drill um, horizontally to, to develop the capacity they need, and then they'll link those together. They're primarily used for liquid storage. They're primarily very shallow underground, and this is almost exclusively for areas where there's not enough surface tanks. The, 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 the requirement is for more surface capacity, for more capacity than they could generate at surface with just metal tanks. Uh, and there's some other pictures here of how that operation goes. Like I said, just traditional mining type type operations. Again, not something that I'm 
particularly familiar with, but I will tell you an interesting thing. I did a similar presentation a couple months ago for India for PDPU and their national reserve, their strategic petroleum reserve is all hard rock cavern. So it's just whatever works for your specific area. And this is another 3D simulation of, you've got the industrial purposes back here as well as the shipping port, but you can see the, the facility itself. There is a surface mine access to get down to level. And then you see all the different room and pillar shafts that are connected. And then they come up to surface. There's just some vent piping and things like that. But it's basically a traditional mining operation that can be used for storage when the other options aren't available. But again, this is a last case scenario. It's a very expensive and it's only effective for essentially refining plants that are in the wrong part of the world or the wrong part of the country that doesn't have access to porous media. Now let's talk about the big boy in terms of quantity. Reservoir and aquifer storage is the largest uh, player in terms of the number of assets, both fields and wells, and the amount of volume that we store. So when we store um, in reservoirs, we can really only store natural gas. I mean, you could store helium. Like I said, that happens out in Oklahoma, and that, there's a weird story behind that that I won't bother telling. But there, during the 2020 economic downturn, you remember that oil futures went negative. They were negative 30 for a while here in the US. And so the Department of Energy actually was looking at the, a theoretical option of using some offshore um, reservoirs to some, some anticlines to um, store crude oil. Um, and actually we got involved on, on helping to write a white, paper, a white paper in response to the government uh, personally, that would be a disaster. I do not recommend it because it's hard enough to get oil out of the ground on traditional production because your recovery rate is small. And so if you keep putting crude oil back in, you're going to keep losing that just because of a variety of things um, associated with the recovery factor. But you can store other gases. Hydrogen, again, is theoretical. We'll talk more about that. CO2 sequestration is a big thing right now. And you can also dispose of industrial waste and waters where they're legal, acid gas injection, other disposal operations, again, just using the uh, pore space for, for storage purposes. Who owns reservoir storage operators? Pretty much the same folks we talked about before, except not refineries and not liquids heavy plays. This is mostly your gas pipeline companies, your storage operators, your marketing firms, you can take a lot of advantage of arbitrage, meaning you can buy low and sell high, but in, unlike a financial transaction in gas storage, you physically need to take possession of the molecules. So you need a place to store that until it's gonna be more expensive in the future so that you can make some money. The utility companies are big players here um, because a lot of times they'll operate their own storage because their, their business model is delivering gas to their customers. So if there's a pipeline outage or it gets very, very cold and they don't have enough supply, they have to tap into their, to their storage. Otherwise, they have to go out and buy gas on the spot market. To give you an example, New York City, for example, I'm not talking about their utility price, what they charge their customer, but they don't have any storage because they're too far to the east. Um, the closest storage is in Pennsylvania. But you know they can buy contracts for somewhere maybe like three or four, and this was before everything went up on prices, but three or four or five dollars per thousand cubic feet for a storage contract. So when it gets cold in the winter, they can just tap onto that and the storage company delivers that to their pipeline and they, they make some money off that. If they had to buy, if there was an outage and they had to buy that same quantity on the spot market, it could be 100 to $120. So you see the difference in terms of supply and demand. So that's why a lot of utilities will make sure that they have their own storage for reliability purposes. And then finally, for public se sector interests, you could own for CO2 initiatives, those are heavily backed. And then the national reserves as well. Um, there's some reasons to have storage that aren't always commercial. When we talk about reservoir storage facilities, you have to understand that very few of them have been built specifically for reservoirs for, for storage at, at all. Most of these fields were converted, the majority of fields in the US were converted to storage in the 60s and 70s, which means they were often drilled in the 20s to the 50s, 
which means there's a lot of old wells out there that are imperfect. They're not API standard. The pipelines are not laid out perfectly, but they were already there. So they saved a lot of capital expense by just using the facilities they had. And over time, they've had to go back and plug wells and replace wells. And there are regulations that require integrity testing and things like that. But it's important to recognize that this industry has been going on for close to 100 years at this point in the US exclusively. Aquifers are almost exactly the same as reservoirs, but there's two main differences. Number one, because there's water in the formation, you do have a lot higher produced water amounts. And number two, because there's water in the formation, you get the benefit of water drive. So you don't lose your pressure as much. So you can deliver more in the late season as you draw it down, but you will need to have adequate water treatment facilities on the surface. Otherwise you're gonna run into a big problem. And when we talk about reservoir storage, you can have either primary or secondary porosity. You can store in the actual pore space, or you can start store in the fracture network, micro fractures, a faulting system, just depends on the, the facility. Uh, the best storage facility that I ever operated personally was entirely secondary porosity. It had one or two porosity in the matrix, but it had a lot of micro fracture um, activity because it was up in the mountains. And so there was a lot of folding and a lot of, of thrust stress. Um, and it was very, very um, high deliverability because of the, the fracture network. When we talk about the things that you need for a storage facility, you need to understand that not every production facility will make for a good storage facility and vice versa, right? So there's different needs for different things. It's just a complete, yes, it's all wells. Yes, it's all underground. Yes, it all involves oil and gas, but there's different business models here. Number one is property rights. It's not any different than any other E&P operation. You need to be able to drill. Now there's different, there's different concepts here because when you're having an ENP contract for production, you're paying someone for the right to take what's out of the pore space. You're paying for the oil or the gas. For a storage lease, you're paying for the rental opportunities for the pore space itself. So it's never going to be as lucrative because you're not giving them a royalty because you're not producing anything, right? You're just storing gas in there temporarily. You're just, you're just renting the warehouse. You need a closed reservoir. That's the most important thing of all um, from a physical standpoint. You cannot afford to lose your customer's gas because most of the storage operators don't actually, like the big pipelines and companies like that, they don't actually own the gas. They just take ownership of the gas from the customer, store it and transport it, and then transfer it back to the customer when needed. So you can't lose your customer's you know, inventory. That would be disastrous, right? You need porosity and permeability, but you need it in the levels that are going to be good because most of your service is going to be, there's two types of service in, in storage. There's base load, as we call it, and then peak day. Base load is basically every day. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. You know, all the power plants are on normal. Everything's running fine. You just need a certain amount to keep things going. Peak day is in the US, it's often tied to very cold weather, but in other places, it's maybe tied to hot weather where more power plants come on that are naturally gas fired and you need more electricity. And so you need a porosity and a permeability that's going to accommodate those really high flow rates. You can't just get away with having good production porosity and permeability, you need really high rates. We'll talk a little bit more about base and working gas, but you need base and working. One, one that belongs to the customer, one belongs to the company, and they help provide pressure so that we can cycle. You need an adequate number of wells. If you don't have enough wells in the field, you're not gonna be able to meet market no matter what kind of pressure you have. You need adequate compression and pipeline. You need it to be sized correctly. You need it to be reliable. You need it to be laid out in a way that makes functional sense so that you can isolate parts of the field if necessary and it preserve pressure. You need that peak day deliverability that we already talked about. You need to be able to hit that market at the very high end when, when your customers are quiet for their contract. You need measurement. Measurement is the cash register of the storage operation. If you don't have good measurement, you're not going to be able to keep good track of your inventory, which means you're ultimately going to lose money. And the number one thing that's important about a storage facility is a market. You need to have a supply market and you need to have a demand market and they need to be in touch with each other because otherwise there's no important, you can have the greatest storage facility in terms of the rock in the world, 
but if no if there is no gas to put in it or if there is no market nearby to use that gas then it doesn't make any sense right so you need that cultural aspect you need that either industrial or residential market to drive it as well um most of you guys since you go to the university of oil and gas don't need to see this so but this is just what we're talking about in terms of pore space and sand grains i'll skip i'll skip over this very quickly um, but when it comes to the geology of reservoir storage closure is critical like i talked about before you really need to make sure that you have reservoir integrity not just well integrity but reservoir integrity as well they go hand in hand but when we come when we talk about the traps it's the same like your structural geology or your petroleum geology course you can use any trap so you can have a stratigraphic trap where you have porosity or permeability pinch outs at the edge of the layers that, that trap the oil in. You can have a structural trap like an anticline or some kind of uh, faulting where you have a non seal, you have a sealing fault or you have uh, a block pushing against into a non permeable zone. Or you can use an aquifer and use the gas water contact as that bounding mechanism to create the integrity. But that's the most important physical feature of a storage facility is that containment mechanism. Um, just another picture that you guys don't necessarily see, but that, that shows the difference there on the right. You've got your you've got your stratigraphic trap, and then you've got your structural traps on the left and the right. We don't have a or on the left and the center. Don't have a picture necessarily of an aquifer, but I don't think we necessarily need one. So let's talk a little bit about natural gas storage. Now I know a lot of this information may be may be interesting in terms of curiosity, but it's not going to be specific to you guys, mostly because you guys don't have to worry about a winter cooling season, which is the predominant commercial driver for the US gas storage market is it gets very, very cold here, um, you know, in certain parts of the country and that's what we use it for. So this is usually I ask a question when I'm doing this presentation in person, but this is all of the storage facilities in the US. And if you know the US a little bit, and I don't know if you can see my cursor, but over here, and I'm bad with colors, but over here past these either green or yellow dots, you've got New York City, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., uh, Baltimore, Maryland, Virginia Beach, a lot of the big Boston and, and Cambridge, a lot of these big cities over here, but you don't see any storage, which doesn't make a lot of sense because that's where the big market would be. That's where all the people live, you know? So why is that the case? And the answer is, is because the geology didn't play along. So over here in the Appalachians where I live, um, that is the closest geology wise that you can get to, um, can you turn on the, I'm trying to see if I can turn on the little um, um, thing that I can show, but, uh, All right, can you see my mouse now? If not, no worries. But I live right here, and you can see we're in the we're in the breadbasket. We're in the heart of the um, of the uh, storage facilities. But that's because that's as close as we can get in terms of having the geology we need to serve those markets up here in Detroit and over here in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and Washington D.C. and New York City. So that's the big thing is it's about placing the markets, the supply markets with the demand market. Now, again, not to get into the details here, but this just shows you the breakdown. There's a lot of numbers here. The main thing is I want you to take away is if you look on the left, you see the traditional oil and gas states are also the traditional storage states, Texas, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Louisiana, even down at the bottom, Oklahoma, my own state of West Virginia. That's where a lot of the storage is because that's where a lot of the production was. But if you look at the number of facilities, right? Salt facilities, like we show here, very small number because they're limited to where we have the salt. Aquifers, there's only 17. They're almost entirely in the Illinois basin, these blue dots out here, just because the geology originally during setup, during deposition, it was a, a, it was a water play. But then you look at the hundreds of facilities. I think there's about 400 different facilities across the country 
1,400 wells and 50 different operators that operate these facilities. So, um, you know, that's just a frame of reference for that. And then this shows the different ranges that we're talking about. There's a wider ranges that the, the shallowest formation I know of is in the state of Kentucky. It's 180 feet deep and it's only a couple hundred pounds. There are some that are 10,000 feet deep. There are some uh, Niagara reefs up in Michigan that can pressure up all the way to 4,000 pounds. But then you see on the um, salt, the domal salt, the average domal salt pressure is 2,600 PSI. So you see that that's where there's a lot of opportunity because the more pressure, the more rate. And rate is what we're talking about here. So this just shows you the variety um, you know, the limitations of certain things, aquifers, depleted reservoirs, we can't go as high a pressure, but we can get higher pressure out of the salts. This is an important thing here too, because, well, I'm sorry, uh, because you see the working gas capacity. So this is the amount of gas that we store in these different areas. We store 3.5 TCF in depleted reservoirs and almost to four when you count the aquifers. And then on the salt, we only store 230 million cubic feet, again, because there's just limited opportunities. But look at the bottom in terms of the percent of the capacity versus the deliverability. Salt only is 5% of the total capacity, but it's almost 20% of the deliverability. That shows you, again, the performance. But you need all of this to make things work over time. You need that uh, balance because as much energy as we need, we're seeing this around the world. You can't pick winners and choose. You can't pick winners and losers in terms of how you want things to go. You have to be able to use all the energy that you have access to, and this just shows you the capacity. Even in 2020, when we were kind of uh, we were, we reached the high, we reached the all-time high in terms of we almost got to that full force for TCF. Just because much like crude oil, people weren't using as much because a lot of places were shut down industrially. But now, oops, now we're back to normal and you see how much we turn over in the year from 1.6 to 3.6. We, so we turn over a good 2 TCF of natural gas every year. And this is information from the federal government. So when we talk a little bit about the commercial uses, this is just a very simple a, a graph. Again, in the U.S., natural gas storage is basically based off of the heating and cooling cycle. It's warm in the summer. We don't need a lot of natural gas. It's cool in the winter, and we need a lot to keep our homes and businesses and schools warm. Um, so it also allows for to flexibility and reliability on your pipelines that we talked about. It also saves you some money by guaranteeing service that you don't have to go out and buy on the spot market. But the big thing down at the bottom is there's been two new things that have happened even in my last you know, 15, 16 years in the industry, which is power load and commercial exploitation or arbitrage. Basically, when gas prices started to swing really high and low, there was a lot of opportunity for equity companies, financial companies to come in and buy futures so they can buy, if they had the money, they can buy today and sell in six months for a dollar or two more per thousand. And you make a ton of money. One And my old company, we did this uh, in our, with our excess capacity. And, and in one year we made $41 million of extra revenue without a single increase in headcount, equipment, anything. It was just the arbitrage because of the market. So that's a big thing. The problem is, is as a storage engineer, it's a nightmare because you're just, your job is to put gas in in the summer and take it out in the winter. But you know when we're doing crazy things like our, you know, the markets don't care about stuff like that necessarily. So you have to, to accommodate that. And the other thing is power load. You see this uh, line I just added to the graph, that's something that started to show up around probably 2009, 2010, when gas got relatively cheap. When it got very warm in the American US, we started seeing a lot more gas-fired power plants come online that had been built because gas was cheap at the time. It was anywhere from two to four dollars a thousand, much cheaper than coal, much cheaper than the other sources. And so for air conditioning, basically, we would need more electric. And so we needed the power plant. So some of those would come on in the middle of the summer. So we would, instead of being able to inject, we would have to just kind of withdraw and stand pat. A lot of times we didn't actually withdraw, but we just didn't use our 
injection capabilities, we sent that gas instead to the power plants. And some of these power plants can burn 250 million cubic feet of gas in a day. So that's a very big amount of, 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 of gas to, to bring online immediately. I talked about working in base gas, and this is a very simple concept for all you reservoir engineers in here. Native gas is everything that's left in the reservoir prior to conversion, which basically means we've reached the end of primary recovery. It's no longer economically viable or physically possible to get that gas out of the ground, so it still sits in there. Let's say that's the amount of gas that carries the reservoir from zero PSI to 50 PSI or 100 PSI, and that's just going to be in the ground forever. We can't get it out because it costs too much. Base gas is however much, well, let's go back to working gas. So working gas is the gas that the customer owns. That's what you take possession of. They want to store that, and then they want it back out when they need it. The base gas is the amount of gas that the company itself owns, the storage operator, and that's the amount of gas that they need to generate the pressure from the native gas level to the bottom of their working gas envelope in terms of pressure, right? Because you can't cycle these, these giant fields all the way down to 50 or 100 pounds every year, right? Sometimes your, your service line pressure on your a pipeline might be four, five, six hundred pounds, maybe a thousand pounds. So in order to get into that, you need a, either a significant amount of compression or you need base gas that props up that reservoir and provides a certain amount of, of pressure that you can help then use to support moving the working gas in and out of the facility. So it's important to recognize that native gas is a sunk cost. It's in the ground. Base gas is owned by the company. And if you abandon the fields, you can take the base gas out and sell it. And it is your, your property. And then working gas is what the customers store every year. That's the important thing you need to get in and out. So the commercial value for natural gas operators, the gas pipelines, the utility companies, the LDCs, which are local distribution companies, those are the, the power companies and the gas companies that send this to the actual homes, um, you know, independent storage companies, and like I said, the financial actors, those are the people who are playing in this. But they're also getting involved in things like leasing the capacity, which is standard, their delivery rates that are Parking and lending is, is another term for what I talked about when you buy low and sell high and make some money off the different, like the stock market. But again, it's just about the reliability of your facility. Storage is biggest. I mean, if you look at Europe right now, if there was more storage, we wouldn't be dealing with as much consternation because of the, the, the issues with Russia, simply because what they're running into now is a lack of reliability. And so the more storage you have, the more unforeseen circumstances you can um, you can mitigate, that you can solve for because you have backup in reserves, right? You know, the term stockpiling comes from the coal industry. And the biggest advantage of coal as a source of energy is you can make a big pile of it when you don't need it. And then when you do need it, you can shovel it into the furnace and you're good to go. So this is another reason like that. And this just shows that it's somewhat complicated, but bear with me here, but this shows that for gas storage, there are two types of value. There's intrinsic and extrinsic value. Intrinsic value is simple. If I take that contract in July where the first, first arrow is, and then I sell or in March, and then I sell that gas in July, I make all the money that goes up in terms of price, right? So if I buy when we don't need a lot of gas and there is a lot, and then later on it goes up in price and I make that money. But the extrinsic value is you can hold that until it goes up even further in the winter or you can cycle it multiple times. So it's not a simple buy low so high. There's a lot of other complexities and a lot of folks at these companies who have economics degrees who understand the perfect time to make their purchases in what quantities and things like that. So now let's talk about how underground trans storage fits in with energy transition. I'm very much still a pro oil and gas individual. I'm not going to tell you anything, um, you know, to the contrary, but I am going to uh, show you where this kind of thing does get involved with, with um, other aspects of the things that are, are being discussed a lot now amongst different parts of our socioeconomic community. The first one is carbon sequestration. So carbon sequestration is very simple. You take the carbon dioxide that gets burned out of the atmosphere 
and you do something with it. Most commonly, you store it underground. That's the goal, is that you, you, would, you would do it that way. Um, you can either remove it directly from the atmosphere, which is very difficult and very costly, but it is something you can do. You can um, actually sequester it naturally in things like swamps and peat bogs and marshlands. That's an agricultural process. You can directly store carbon uh, in oceanic waters, which was new to me. But again, these things all scale. The only thing that really scales is directly capturing exhaust from fuel gases and things like, you know, burning coal, burning carbon dioxide, industrial waste, ethanol, and then storing it in underground reservoirs. We won't be doing this in salt caverns, trust me, salt caverns are more important for things like hydrogen and fuels, but we're looking at aquifers and other areas where we could potentially take advantage of, of some of this other stuff. Um, carbon sequestration, you know, the things that can go into, you know, looking at this stuff is, you know, you can put it into deep saline formations, putting it, because of the chemical reaction, storing carbon dioxide in aquifers is much more advantageous than storing it just in a dry gas reservoir. So there's a lot going on there. You gotta, you gotta worry yourself about the depths, the pressures, the temperatures, much like gas storage, you have to worry about not just capacity, but permeability and porosity because these are long-term disposal plays, right? You wanna store these things for decades, not just a short period of time. So a lot of this is still being examined. A fun fact is in the US, there is only one, as much as people talk about it, there's only one carbon sequestration facility active right now. It's an ethanol plant out in Illinois. A second facility is coming online in North Dakota later this year. And then there are as many more that have been the parts of regulations. And WSP does a lot of that work. In fact, the last two disposal wells that were permitted came through our group, but it just takes a lot of, it's a government process. So it takes a lot of time and it's a new process. So the regulations are still being built. The hydrogen economy is a big thing right now, but the main thing you need to take away is that when people talk about storing hydrogen, there's a lot of complications. There's only four car uh, hydrogen storage facilities in the US that are currently active. All of them are in salt caverns. There's one in the UK that's also in salt caverns. And more importantly, there has never been a proof of concept of storing hydrogen in a reservoir. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that is, but it is going to be a huge challenge. And I'm not sure if it can be overcome just because of the physics. But for as much as people think about how hydrogen will be a, a big part of our fuel mix going forward, it's the same thing as everything else. You have to be able to provide it reliably, um, economically, affordably, and uh, it has to be accessible to places, not just in the in the Western world, but for, for all places around the globe. Um, it is the best renewable energy when it comes to, it has zero emissions. It does not, when you burn hydrogen, it has a high energy content by weight and it does not generate a carbon-based emission. Um, but you, to, to, do, to do all the stuff at scale, it's really gonna be a challenge. Um, the ACES project, this one out here in Utah, which is over here in the West, that's a new project that WSP is actually the general contractor for. It's a very exciting project for us. Um, but basically this is how it works. It's trying to serve the California renewables market. And so it takes excess power sources from uh, different renewable, renewable sources like solar, wind, and hydro. And it takes that and then it converts it into hydrogen through electrolyzers, right? So it breaks down water into hydrogen, stores that, in salt caverns. And then when it's needed, it brings it out either for power generation, industrial purposes, or to transport to other sources. So that's what they call green hydrogen because the hydrogen comes exclusively from renewable sources. Um, so that's what they're trying to do. And it is very expensive. It is very difficult. You have to have the storage and the salt caverns to make it work. Um, but we're drilling a well out there very soon. We're, they're developing 8 billion uh, barrels of capacity out there to go along with a, a similar amount that's already existing. So folks are serious about this, but we'll just have to wait and see if it's the right solution for everybody over time. The big problems with hydrogen, though, are chemistry, geology, and compatibility. Geology is that all of this boils down to hydrogen is not inert, right? Methane is inert. 
right? Sometimes we'll have bacterial corrosion, but the methane itself doesn't interact with the rock matrix, doesn't interact with most of the conate fluids. It's basically just a, you know, a, a dumb chemical we pump down a hole and then get back out. But for geology, we worry about not just the permeability in terms of um, hydrogen is one tenth the size of a methane molecule. So we worry about the permeability being a problem in the sense of allowing paths of communication that were not intended that pro run problems into containment. It has reactivity, not just with the conate fluids, but with the matrix itself, as well potentially as the cap rock. So you worry about whether or not you're going to run into long-term degradation of your containment mechanism because the hydrogen is chemically reactive. Thing. Compatibility is a big problem as well because uh, hydrogen hates metal, right? St it, steel embrittlement, um, deterioration of uh, seals, both metal and elastomers, and the operational stresses that it puts on because there's less energy in hydrogen by volume than there is in methane to the tune of about a third. And so in order to get the same amount of volume, you have to either pressure things up higher or you have to cycle these things more frequently, in which case you're putting more stress, not just on the cavern it, itself or the reservoir, I guess, but also the materials, your surface piping, your, your casing and things like that. So you have a lot of potential for fracture, for, for leak development and things like that. And I've already mentioned the stuff about chemistry, but the last thing is compressibility is a problem. Compressibility of, of hydrogen is above one and it, go, it gets higher as you go um, higher pressures, unlike natural gas, which there's a sweet spot around 2000 PSI where it's actually more efficient. Hydrogen is always more difficult to compress and it gets harder the more you put in. I talked about the molecular sizing and the heat transfer is a problem. Hydrogen has a negative uh, Joule-Thompson coefficient, which means when you release it through a choke, it actually heats up. And so when you release it into like a cavern, for example, you worry about degradation to the shoe, you worry about other heat transfer to the walls around it. And because we're cycling things so often, you know, there could be some problems there. All of this stuff isn't to say that it can't be solved theoretically, but it is going to be a challenge, that's for sure, because as of right now, it's not a known solution. You know, it's not something that we've got solved. We can just take off the shelf and implement with the right amount of money. We've got to solve all this stuff. So for domal caverns, hydrogen is good to go. We're doing that right now. No worries. For bedded salts, it's never been done before, again, because of some of the concerns with migration, but it might be a possibility. But for porous reservoirs, a lot of research continues to be done and will continue to be done. But it's important to recognize that there's no proof of concept to date. The only places they've done this is there's one town in France that has a high concentration of hydrogen in their, in their town gas. And there's a government project in the Netherlands that is looking at this. But again, when we talk about um, hydrogen, they're talking about high blends. So it's like 10, 15, 10, 20, 30% hydrogen. It's not necessarily that. And this is even before we start talking about the base gas. Why are we going to use natural gas for base gas? In which case we have blending problems. Are we going to use hydrogen? In which case it's incredibly expensive, maybe impossible. Are you going to use nitrogen? Who knows? So there's just a The most important thing to understand about storage and hydrogen is there's a lot more that we need to learn before it becomes a possibility. Storage in the news we'll cover over, we'll, um, we'll move away from this because a lot of this stuff is, is US centric, but you know, we've had some failures. We saw the oil market go to negative last in 2020 because of lack of storage. Warren Buffett of Berkshire Hathaway bought Dominion Energy, which was at the time, I think the third biggest pipeline company in the US um, a couple years ago, showing what he thinks is the value of this kind of infrastructure. And if you look at things, long-term reliability, there's a lot of people who are starting to realize, you know, is this realistic? The European Commission after COP26, you know, they're all excited about hydrogen and CO2 and things like that. But after that happened, um, the European Commission and Ursula von der Leyen came out and started a proposal to reclassify nuclear and natural gas as green technologies, because they're seeing in Europe that they're running out of energy because they have disincentivized investment 
in these affordable kinds of energy, and it's leaving people without the energy they need. Prices are going through the roof, and you know, politically, it's not a very good uh, situation for them. So that's where this is all going in terms of the news. The, mo the main thing to recognize is underground storage, no matter where you live, is a critical part of our energy infrastructure. Even if you don't have it in your country, your country is using other people's storage in order to help facilitate their supply chain of crucial elements and things like that. Due to regulations like flaring restrictions, ESG reports, other kind of proactive subsidies for things like tax credits for carbon sequestration, there's an increased value in existing facilities. Our company gets calls all the time from people who are looking about looking to buy new facilities or they have a facility, they want us to do a due diligence report to kind of investigate it. People are excited about this because there's a lot of money and a lot of talk about it. Carbon sequestration has been around for 40 years, but it's never been full sale used because it's not economically viable. It's only going to be used if there is some kind of government penalties or as in the US right now, there's a tax credit. You can get paid $55, $55 per ton for carbon that you store from a non-oil and gas purposes. And that's why the ethanol plant is in place because ethanol, it's also about purity. So ethanol is the easiest way to capture CO2 from the process stream. And it's also a very high purity of CO2. So it's, it, it's uh, economically more viable. And then like we said, hydrogen storage, any of this stuff that's going to scale globally has to have underground storage, um, or there has to be technological innovations. The Elon Musks of the world have to figure something out that I, you know, that I won't, uh, because right now there is no proof of concept that hydrogen will work at the levels that it might work in some specific areas for some smaller groups of people. But this, we've been using hydrogen for 200 years for different purposes. But this is the first time we've ever talked about replacing all of our energy as a base fuel source with hydrogen. So there's a lot that we have to understand. So just summarizing everything, underground storage has been around for a long time. It's going to be around for a long time. It's going to be, have new uses, not just for the traditional ones. Caverns, reservoirs, hard rock caverns, aquifers, all of them are out there. And it depends on your specific location and business need. Um, the end users are going to use this to, to control their flexibility, their reliability. It's important to understand why we're doing this from a business standpoint, because none of these companies are running charities. Pipe is expensive, horsepower is expensive, you know, base gas is expensive. And as we look into things like carbon sequestration, hydrogen, acid gas injection, disposal, storage will always be more and more important going, going forward into the future. That's almost exactly an hour. This is my personal contact information. Many of you I saw join me on LinkedIn this past week. That is my personal email. Um, if you want my WhatsApp, I'll get just send me an email. I'll give that to you as well. Um, you are more than welcome to send me any questions about anything at any point. The only thing I will tell you is I do not have the ability to find you a job. So if you want some advice on you know, places to look or look over your resume or talk about opportunities or talk about technical things, I'm always happy to help. Um, but please recognize that, uh, you know, I can't, I can't find folks jobs. There's just too many people reaching out for that. But with that being said, I'll turn it back over to our moderator and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, all right, for now, uh, thanks for Mr. Evans. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the attendants, anyone have questions? You can post it into the chats. Uh, Mr. Evans, are you ready to answer some questions sure. uh, by my colleagues? Sure. Uh, the first question is, who owns the pore space in the United States? So this is a very interesting question, but in the pore space, usually it goes to the um, surface owner, right? So it's not the mineral owner. You know, in the U.S., a lot of times the minerals and the surface rights are separated, but um, the pore space is often owned by the surface owner themselves. So whether or not there's any production at all, the, the surface owner. So you still have to get a lease for it, but oftentimes it's not the mineral owner that you have to track down, which makes it easier because it's usually the person who's physically on the property. You don't have to chase down 
who has the mineral rights from you know 30 or 40 years ago when people were putting together drilling blocks all right so the other question that goes is it worthwhile in iraq okay so i um i tried to do some research knowing i was coming um uh, going to be speaking to this group to try and I always try to do some local content. I could not find anything about the storage in Iraq other than surface storage associated with pipelines. There is um, some salt deposits in the northeastern portion of the country. I don't know where that sits against your traditional gas fields um, and um, and what you know what markets may be the case. If you can develop a reasonable salt cavern uh, storage operation, it's almost always viable and worthwhile, regardless of where it is, right? Just because it's so convenient to store the commodity, to have access to it for a variety of different reasons. Even if you're not selling it to a, a third party or are exporting it to another country, just for your own internal uses. But I, unfortunately, I don't know enough about the salt geology but I would imagine, given that you you guys are still on your primary production of um, what what percentage of of natural gas production would you say comes out of Iraq in a day? I mean, is it like I mean, it seems to me like we're pretty much still on primary production of oil in Iraq, right? Some maybe somebody's on mute. Or oh, oh, maybe maybe, I'll, maybe the answer is in the chat. I'll scroll down. Okay, so if we're still producing mostly crude oil, unless you need a strategic uh, reserve for crude, um, you know, I, natural gas is more lucrative from a storage standpoint. Um, unless you're going to be exporting that crude, and you don't and you don't have enough pipeline takeaway capacity with tankers. But since you guys have access to the Gulf, since you have um, uh, since, since since you have good infrastructure for that, it may not be as worthwhile because these are, these are very expensive things to set up. But unfortunately, I don't have a, enough specific answer for that. That might be something I continue to do some research on. Um, there was another question from Yusuf about what makes drilling a dry hole advantageous. Um, so in the case of underground storage, um, a lot of the holes that were drilled historically that were um, dry holes, that's how you determined the, the extent of your reservoir, right? So if you, if you mapped all of your, I mean, we're talking in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, right? So if you mapped all of your, um, you know, your, your wells and all of your competitors' wells, you just drew a line where all of the dry holes were, and that was your field, right? And we still use a lot of that today, even though now we have modern things like seismic and other kind of ways of doing that. Um, but you know, even if you drill a dry hole, recognizing in storage, a lot of the production is already gone. So drilling a dry hole gives you opportunities for cores, for sidewall cores, for you know various other formation logs that might help you be a better storage operator. And the question is, has the underground storage industry been affected by COVID? Um, yes, we were, we were not um, immune to that. My company hasn't had a layoff in 20 years because as a storage operator, it doesn't matter if, uh, if gas is $2 a thousand or $20 a thousand, you still need to store it and ship it. But even we were uh, not immune to the economic downturn of 2020. So we had to lay some people off, but we've hired a lot of them back. But mostly in storage, because it's weather dependent, it's, it's federally regulated, um, the work keeps on going. And a lot of the folks that come to us to work in storage come from the exploration and production background because they prefer working in the storage market because it's more stable, right? Because, you know, right now oil prices are $110 and, you know, tons of people are hiring. But as soon as that goes back down to 50 or 60, whenever that might be, and I'm not predicting the future, we all know that there's tons of layoffs at those big companies. So people kind of like the stability about that. Uh, is there another question? Oh yeah, so if we're only producing 378 BCF 
in 2019. I imagine you can direct consume or direct export that without needing to store it um, because that's, I mean, for one country, that's huge. But um, given how much your economy is built on hydrocarbon exports, I think, I think gas storage is probably not as lucrative as just continuing to develop your, your, the efficiencies of your exports, maybe some gas treatment facilities to, to convert to LNGs and things like that. But I would investigate for any of you all that are in looking for research type things, investigate that salt deposits up in the Northeast and see where that sits against your traditional production environments and see if there might be some opportunities there. Any other questions? You got me all day, I'm not in a rush. Uh, all right, so uh, um, are we finished with questions? Any questions? Well, there is one more comment from Yusuf about we flare half the gas and that, and I understand that, but that honestly, that's the biggest advantage is it's not, is if you wanna develop storage to store the flared gas, that's a huge thing. Not only does it help with for environmental causes, and, and, I'm, and I'm not pushing for that necessarily, though I think we should all be better stewards of the environment. We've run into that same situation in West Texas, because out in West Texas, we have a lot of, you know, in the Permian Basin, you may have heard about, we have a lot of, of gas development, but there's no infrastructure because nobody lives in West Texas. I mean, the biggest town out there is Midland. It's like 50,000 people, and it's just people who work in the oil field. So there is no place to pipe the gas to and building pipelines is expensive. So they flared a lot of it, but then the government came in and said, look, you can't be flaring this gas because it's just a waste and it's a huge uh, you know, knock on our environmentals. So that's where you could maybe take some of these depleted reservoirs in these areas, use some of the same wells, maybe the ones that are in their older life cycle, and then develop small storage pools so that, that when you do need the gas or when you do get to the point where gas becomes more popular or necessary, you can lay some pipelines, some compressors and take advantage of it. That's actually a huge opportunity um, and very worthwhile for your situation. So thanks for bringing that up. Flared, I hate flaring gas, not the environmental aspect, although that's bad as well. I hate it because it's a waste because I've only ever worked in natural gas my whole career. I've never been responsible for the production of a single barrel of oil. So bars, right? That's the money. So I don't want to waste it if I don't have to. Uh, uh, colleagues, any future, any, any further questions you have? Mr. Zachary said that he, he has the whole evening, so he has to bear with us. <laughs> no, no pressure, but no pressure. But, uh, you know, I do. Uh, I'm always happy to help. And like I said, you guys have my information and I will send the um, um, uh, PDF version of my slides um, to to the group so that you get, can have those in the future. And if you have any questions or anything going forward. Um, just feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to talk about this stuff. And if you have any other questions about just general, you know, career advice or questions about things, that's what the SBE is all about. Um, and I'm always happy to contribute in that fashion too. And, and if I ever find myself back in that neck of the woods, I'll see if I can make my way to Basra and, and come visit in person. Uh, big thanks to Mr. Zachary Evans. Uh, very glad to have you today. And we wish to have you on uh, some uh, further future occasions. Uh, very, ha uh, very happy to have you here today. Uh, once again, thank you, Mr. Evans. No, thank you guys for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, uh, colleagues, uh, here's an announcement. I uh, would like you uh, to uh, register for the, uh, for the link we have just posted in the chat. Uh, the, at the attendance uh, if you would, uh, we would be pleased uh, to have your names on this uh, form. All right. بالنسبة للشباب الحضور إذا ممكن تسجلون بالاستمارة رابط موجود بالشات. شكرا جزيلا لكم.